Hello and welcome to Terra Verde, your weekly environmental radio show. I'm your host today, Gary Hughes. As a KPFA volunteer and member of the Terra Verde Collective, I always try to start the show describing how very amazing it is for all of us from the Terra Verde team to be in the studio contributing to KPFA on a regular weekly basis. It is a true honor to be here bringing you news, views, events, and insights related to what is happening on the biosphere protection and environmental justice fronts here in our home state of California, around the nation, and around the world. I want to thank all of the KPFA listeners who are tuned in today to our program and who will keep tuning in to Terra Verde in the future. I also want to thank all the staff and volunteers at KPFA who do all the necessary work that makes it possible for us to be here. It is really an incredible opportunity to be contributing to the KPFA community, and we truly believe that community radio gets the goods now more than ever. This past week has been host to a series of events and actions in recognition of the 50th anniversary of one of the most formative events resulting in greater environmental awareness and broader political support for natural resource policy that prioritizes the public interest. I'm speaking of the tragic Santa Barbara Channel Platform A blowout oil spill, which occurred 50 years ago, January 28th. To put that 50-year anniversary of the spill into context, we're going to speak in depth during today's show about current and future threats to California's oceans and coasts from offshore oil development. There is little doubt that 50 years after the Santa Barbara spill that our oceans remain at great risk due to the excesses of the oil and gas industry, including the blatant overreach of the new federal executive to propose the expansion of drilling in federal waters. Joining me today for Terra Verde to provide us a report on recent activities commemorating the anniversary of the Santa Barbara spell, spill and as well a thorough update on the Trump proposal for expanded drilling in federal waters are Linda Kropp, an attorney who serves as chief counsel with the Santa Barbara-based Environmental Defense Center, who will be joining us by phone, and Blake Kopshow, Ocean's campaigner with the Center for Biological Diversity, who is right here in the studio with me. It is great to have you on the show, Blake. Thanks for making it. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks, Gary. Thanks to all the KPFA listeners as well for tuning in today. Uh, Excited to have a good chat about our campaign to stop offshore drilling off the California coast and in all our oceans. Thanks for being here, Blake. It's going to be a great show. And as I said, we also have Linda on the phone. How are you doing, Linda? I'm doing great, Gary. Thanks for having me. And thanks to KPFA and Terra Verde for doing this show. Fantastic. Linda, thank you so much for joining us. I'd I'd like to start with you to bring you in over the distance. You're on the phone. I want to make sure listeners know you're close with us. I think it would be great to start by your giving Terra Verde listeners a brief glimpse into the history and background of your organization in advocating for California ocean and coastal protection. For instance, if if I totally understand it right, the birth of the Environmental Defense Center is really closely connected to the grassroots response to the 1969 drilling uh, spill in the Santa Barbara Channel. So could you describe some of that history and, and provide listeners some, some background on your organization as we get started? Sure, thank you. Uh, the 1969 oil spill was, at that time, the largest oil spill in the nation's history. It's referred to as the spill that was heard around the world because it was the first time that we had a major catastrophic event like that um, off of our shores and really woke people up to the threats and the risks of this new uh, burgeoning industry. And um, that spill led directly to the enactment of a lot of federal legislation that we can get into in more detail if you like. it led to the first Earth Day. It uh, spawned a lot of uh, campuses to establish environmental studies programs. And then locally in Santa Barbara, uh, the response was immediate in terms of people rushing to the beaches, seeing the damage, trying to help. And several organizations were spawned, um, including the Environmental Defense Center, which was formed as the legal arm for the community. Other groups focused on activism, education, um, and collectively, we continue to work together 50 years later. Okay. Well, I think we'll do what we can to bring 
uh, Linda back in. And in the moment, meantime, though, what I'd like to do is keep things flowing, Blake. We have a feeling now for the background of the Environmental Defense Center, and we'll bring Linda back in to, you know, talk about the formative moment 50 years ago. Uh, but you were working with Linda recently quite a bit on some of these activities around the 50th anniversary. So can you tell us a little bit of the approach of the Center for Biological Diversity in recognizing the importance of this 50-year anniversary, although your organization is is much younger by some standards? Yeah, the, the Center's been around for um, about 27 years now. Uh, we focus on protecting wildlife and endangered species um, by leveraging some of the nation's bedrock environmental laws. Uh, we use a lot of creative media uh, and grassroots organizing as well. Um, and one of the things that we wanted to make sure happened on the 50th anniversary of the spill is uh, letting the Trump administration know that Californians adamantly oppose his plan to expand offshore oil and gas drilling off our coast and in all of our oceans. And we'll get into some more details about that plan, I'm sure, later in the show. Um, so we organized a protest at the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management office down in Camarillo, which is the, the regional office for the, the Pacific Coast. And the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, or BOEM, is the agency that's responsible for leasing our oceans to oil and gas companies so that they can drill and frack for oil and gas. And so we knew it was a perfect opportunity on the 50th anniversary of the spill to commemorate the spill by highlighting the fact that 50 years later, offshore drilling remains d a dirty and dangerous p practice and it doesn't belong in our oceans. Uh, and then again, really, really turning out a bunch of people from local community in California uh, and expressing their displeasure with Trump's plan to expand drilling off of our coast. And I think we succeeded in making that happen on Monday, which was the, the, the initial day that the spill happened. So it was right on the anniversary. Right on January 28th. And, Correct. And the spill uh, was enormous. Linda, you're back with us again. Do I, am I sure that you've got back onto the phone? Yes. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much for your patience. We're really glad to be having you here, and thank you to all the listeners who are tuned in as, as we work, and thank you very much again uh, to our engineer, Mike, for making it happen. Linda, you were helping me work through some of the numbers. I'd done some research over time, and I'd cranked around uh, around the numbers for the, uh, you know, the actual size of this 1969 spill, and you see different media reports. They talk about 3 million, and then I had kind of latched on to this 3.3 million gallons of crude that were spilled. But you were suggesting, Linda, that a closer uh, analysis of the numbers uh, would say that it was upwards of 4 million gallons of crude that were spilled into the channel of uh, this ongoing gusher from Platform A in 1969? Yeah, there's a wide range of estimates on the size of the spill. Um, the figure that we rely on is the figure from the United States Coast Guard, which estimated that a hundred more than a hundred thousand barrels of crude oil spilled into the ocean, and so that is equal to more than four million gallons. And the spill, uh, you know, washed up on beaches, you know, over thirty to forty miles in Santa Barbara and Ventura counties, and killed just you know hundreds of seabirds and wildlife. And one of the things a lot of people don't know is it wasn't just a single event. There was a blowout that occurred on January 28th, and it took about 10 or 11 days to plug that one well. But in the meantime, that blowout had caused so many fractures in the subsea reservoirs that oil continued, continued to spill through December 1969. And that's why you see such a wide range of estimates because if you look at the entire amount of oil that um, spilled it went on for months and months okay and so this it was really was um a formative uh moment i know for myself as as a very young child uh, that spill wasn't as present for me as uh the subsequent spill a couple years later of um the kind of infamous tanker wreckage that happened, the wreck that happened just outside the Golden Gate Bridge in January 1971. And um, as a kid, uh, though my parents didn't, you know, rally to the cause to help, I, w I was in San Francisco and I, I remember that it was formative for me. 
as a kid. Um, so, you know, these moments uh, have, have really uh, birthed in many different ways what we know as the uh, modern environmental movement. Uh, without really dwelling too much on, on where the environmental movement is now, I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the activities that you were involved with, Linda, in commemorating this this 50th anniversary. And I know that the Environmental Defense Center was involved with a really cool call to action show in Santa Barbara on Sunday. And, there's, and then as well, um, I read about a really special... A special collections exhibit that was opened at the University of California, Santa Barbara on Monday, the 28th as well. Could, could you speak about those events, Linda? I think they'd be really interesting to listeners to know about that kind of work to draw attention to this historical moment. Well, as I mentioned, some groups in our area formed immediately in response to the 69 oil spill and we're still going strong. So the four groups, including the Environmental Defense Center, Community Environmental Council, Get Oil Out, and UCSB uh, Environmental Studies Program put together an event on Sunday, January 27th, um, that was a call to action. And we we sold out the Arlington Theater, had a couple thousand people, and we not only reflected on what happened in 69 and the incredible response, all the laws that were enacted um, with bipartisan support signed by a Republican president and a Republican governor. Um, But we looked at what's happening today. Here we are 50 years later. Um, I think after the 69 spill, a lot of people thought that that was going to be the end of this experimental offshore drilling. Um, It was obviously unsafe and incredibly dangerous. And here we are 50 years later, and uh, the federal administration wants to open up the entire West Coast, including the entire coast of California, to brand new oil leasing and development. So, you know, starting another 50 plus years of offshore oil and gas development. Um, So that was one reason for the call to action. We do have this direct threat right now from the Trump administration. Uh, We're expecting the proposed uh, oil leasing program to hit the streets any day now but we also wanted to focus a lot on the bigger threat we're facing of climate change and um so we had some national speakers some state and local speakers um one of the most exciting parts of the event was um after the 69 oil spill some professors at uc santa barbara wrote a declaration of environmental rights because there's nothing in the U.S. Constitution or Bill of Rights about the environment. So they wrote a Declaration of Environmental Rights that was read into the congressional record and led to the very first uh, modern environmental law, the National Environmental Policy Act. So we um, put together a group to update that, and we had a a reading involving folks of all ages, all ethnic backgrounds, genders, you know, really diverse look at, you know, where we want to go for the future. Um, So that was part of the intent of the program. And then out at UCSB, they've done an incredible job collecting archives um, from uh, academics, reporters, um, community groups and individuals that have anything related to the 69 oil spill. And this exhibit will be um, up and running for a few months now. Um, So if anyone wants any information about the 69 spill and the aftermath, it's fortunately housed in one place now. Well, this is really, really valuable information to be sharing with listeners to know that this type of historic event is also being well documented and that the evidence is being preserved um, for future study. Thanks to Linda Crop for joining myself and Blake Kopshow from the Center for Biological Diversity on Terra Verde. We're on KPFA 94.1 FM. My name is Gary Hughes, and I'm your host today. We've been looking hard at the past of offshore, offshore oil drilling and hinted a bit at the present. And though there's quite a bit of information that we could spend some time delving into about uh, the 50-year anniversary, I, I want to be really cognizant of the short amount of time we have on the show and really try to dig into what's happening right now and the threats, the imminent threats threats of future uh, development, offshore oil drilling. So, Blake, this is perhaps you could 
um, help out a little bit and provide listeners a little bit of a, a deep dive on this story that uh, many may have already been following about uh, what Linda was speaking of, of, of the Trump administration's, uh, you know, new vision for expanding uh, drilling. But this is actually also a process that is um, still guided by the nation's environmental bedrock laws. So it's been kind of slow coming. It's a slow train, even as fast as it's coming. So can you tell a little bit of the back, you know, from 2017, a lot of stuff happening in 2018 and what, what we're worried about that could be happening real sh- briefly here? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that we have to actually quickly go back to the end of the Obama administration, actually, to put in context uh, the, the the scale of the uh, proposed expansion of what Trump is trying to do. Because uh, so... The Bureau of Ocean Energy Management develops what's called a five-year leasing plan, and that essentially is a calendar uh, that schedules leases in various parts of our ocean. Um, And the Obama administration finalized that five-year leasing plan just before he left office. I think it was actually uh, in January, right before he left. And um, due to some incredible national level campaign work on the keep it in the ground campaign that groups like the center uh, and many others across the country were involved in that five-year leasing plan uh, didn't include any offshore and gas leases on the Atlantic coast. It didn't include any leases scheduled on the Pacific coast. Uh, The overwhelming majority of the Arctic ocean was actually permanently protected from new oil and gas leases. Um, Unfortunately, the Gulf of Mexico was included in Obama's five-year plan that continues to be our nation's energy. Still something of a sacrifice zone. Yep, exactly. Um, But Obama's five-year plan contained the central and western Gulf of Mexico and one little um, piece of Alaska, the Cook Inlet. And those were the only leases that were scheduled um, over the course of the next five years. Now, when Trump got elected, he pretty quickly said, well, we're going to throw that one out the window uh, and develop a new five-year plan, uh, which is pretty incredible because, as you mentioned, uh, the process of developing that five-year plan is governed by some of our bedrock environmentals, OXLA, the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act, NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act. And so uh, in order to develop that plan, it's a, it's a two-year process. And so we just went through two years of developing this plan and working with activists and advocates across the country to really minimize the amount of leasing in our oceans. And then um, it, it's funny, Trump didn't actually throw it out the window because we're still holding the leases that are part of Obama's five-year plan while we're developing a new five-year plan. So that almost brings us up to speed. Um, The first thing that Trump did was issue an executive order directing Secretary Zinke at the time to develop a new five-year leasing plan. And then, uh, so the steps since then have been they issued a call for nominations, which essentially is a call to the oil industry to let the Department of the Interior and BOEM know where they'd like to drill off of all of our coasts. They said, hey, let us know. We're all ears. Where do you want to drill? Um, And then the next phase was issuing the draft proposed five-year leasing plan. And this is the one that we've been talking about today. So that was issued in January of 2018. So just about a year ago, right after the New Year's, the plan was released. And this is an unprecedented expansion of offshore and gas being proposed, as I mentioned. And this is where some folks may remember then that there was a large gathering Uh, and March in Sacramento, uh, recognizing the one public meeting in California that the Department of uh, Interior was willing to hold on this matter. Right. So the release of the plan triggered a 60-day comment period um, where uh, concerned citizens are encouraged to... um, submit their public comment and the national coalition of groups working on this reached out to all their members and we collected uh, i think 1.3 million comments from americans saying we don't want any new drilling in any of our oceans not just again off the california coast Um, but then some of the local organizing here in california yeah focused on turning out people to that one public meeting uh, in sacramento these meetings are actually have been designed to minimize public input Um, you don't even get an opportunity to voice your opposition to the plan in front of for example a crowd uh, where the media can pay attention Instead, it's uh, it's BOEM employees interacting with you one on one. So they've really done a good job of really, um, yeah, m- minimizing the the public's ability to to 
to say how they feel about this. Um, and it's, it's pretty disheartening. But w- what is exciting is that um, we got over five or 600 people to come to Sacramento on a, a Tuesday. Yeah, it was a very exciting day. Yeah. It was a beautiful day. And then public comment in opposition was overwhelming. And then that public comment period closed. And now it's, it's been a waiting game for the final a five-year plan to be released. So tell us a little bit about that waiting game and, and from your observing the process, what you're anticipating. Yeah. So um, we... Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, Linda, you Linda, wanted you to add something? Jump in? Go for it. Yeah, if I could. Um, so, yeah, the next step is um, the proposed program was due out in mid-January, but it's delayed because of the government shutdown. And then at the same time, a draft environmental impact statement will be available for public review and comment for 90 days. Um, so it's really important that people participate. And as Blake said, this is unprecedented. Under law, the government is supposed to look at the nation's energy needs for a five-year period and be very discreet about the areas um, that may be opened for new development to meet that need. There's no way the entire nation's coast needs to be opened up for oil and gas development. In fact, we're exporting oil right now. Um, but the Trump administration has put the entire coast, um, over 90% of the nation's coast, including national marine sanctuaries, marine protected areas, federal ecological preserves, everything is on the table. This has never been done before. So, um, yeah, we encourage you to, you know, sign up for our action alerts, um, and we'll let you know when the plan, um, the next round of comments begins. Um, but it's really important for people to speak up. One other thing that you know, we worked on really hard to try to prevent this plan from going forward is we sponsored some state legislation with um, State Senator Hannah-Beth Jackson and Assemblymember uh, Muratsuchi that would prevent any new infrastructure um, to allow oil that is produced in federal waters from crossing through state waters to get to shore for you know, processing and refining and marketing. So um, the state is really trying to do what it can, but we need everybody's help. I would really like to continue to discuss the significance of the passage of that state legislation last summer, Linda, um, as well for listeners to recognize that that your work in the Environmental Defense Center had such a crucial ro- role in, in really crafting that legislation and, and, and really, um, you know, uh, bringing um, that stuff through to the finish line, it was it was quite an uh, uphill battle because of you know certain sectors that were in opposition. But can can we go a little bit further then with this state legislation passed that really kind of um, you know inhibits the development of new fossil fuel infrastructure that would serve these you know potential new federal leases? Would would that I mean? What does that do in terms of affecting how the federal government would move forward? Would they just go ahead and, and propose what they want uh, and, you know, to, you know, to whatever, just blow the state off completely? Well, we're hoping it discourages any leasing off the coast of California. The legislation makes it harder. It doesn't completely ban the development. The state can't do that because the leasing would be in federal waters. So it, it's definitely puts up an obstacle. And, you know, in the state of California, we have issued no new oil leases since the 1969 spill. And in fact, in 1994, the state legislature passed the California Coastal Sanctuary Act, which prohibits new leasing. So the state has been really careful and diligent. Um, and we need to do as much as we can to prevent the federal drilling from going forward because as we know from platform a which was in federal waters you know just because the platform is sitting further off our coast doesn't mean that an oil spill doesn't impact you know the entire you know region um, both offshore and onshore so um so we're hoping that the state legislation sends a strong message and will help discourage leasing off of our coast Okay, and do you want to add anything to that, uh, Blake, from your experience, these, these dynamics between um, the state and the federal government, and then also because of the way you're working on a national level? I know that there's other states that, even previous to California, but since then have been um, considering or even succeeding in passing similar measures. Yep, correct. Um, a few things, I guess. Um, 
it's true that a couple other states have picked up the mantle from California and worked to enact similar legislation. Um, I think one really phenomenal standout was actually a voter approved measure in Florida, um, which bans offshore oil and gas drilling in state waters off of uh, the coast of Florida, I believe on the Gulf Coast and on the East Coast as well. Um, and that, that was incredible because that was approved by a highly significant or um, a high majority of voters. I think it was, I think it had to be 60%, um, not positive, but Anyway, it passed with flying colors in Florida, which is, of course, um, not as blue of a state as somewhere like California. So that was great to see. It kind of does represent, though, uh, in a polarized nation, this is one topic that draws, um, you know, support from many different demographics. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's bipartisan, bicoastal opposition to the expansion of offshore oil and gas drilling. Absolutely. Um, one other thing that I, I, w- I wanted to m- mention is sort of going back to this response to the five-year plan that Linda was talking about. Um, one thing that we're going to make sure happens here in California is that no matter what's included in the plan, um, we're going to come out strongly and forcefully in opposition to it because we know that Californians strongly oppose offshore drilling off their coasts, but Californians also oppose drilling in all of our oceans because we know that drilling anywhere affects the climate everywhere. It impacts coastal communities everywhere. Um, And so we're really planning a strong, powerful grassroots response uh, to the five-year plan when it comes out. That's so exciting to know that groups like the Center for Biological Diversity and Environmental Defense Center are watchdogging the situation and are uh, prepared to offer concerned citizens the information and material that they need to engage on this in an effective way. And Linda, we're wrapping up really quick on the show. There's so much that we haven't covered that would have been great to get into, but I want to make sure that you have a chance to share a last couple of words about how people can stay involved and how they can continue to learn about your organization really quickly now as we get close to the end. Thank you again so much for having this show. Um, yeah, so if you can go to our website, environmentaldefensecenter.org, you can sign up for our action alerts, and we'll let you know when um, anything is happening with the offshore leasing program, and there's also a lot of uh, really uh, scary onshore oil development projects in our county as well that are very carbon-intensive and dirty. So uh, if you sign up on our website for action alerts, we'll keep you posted. Thank you so much. Yeah, Linda, thank you so much for joining us on Terra Verde today. And Blake, do you have some last words for listeners about how to stay involved and how to learn about the work that the Center for Biological Diversity is doing? Yeah, we also have a website, of course, um, and we have an offshore drilling-focused website. It's endangeredoceans.org, and I'd encourage everyone to go check that out. It really houses all of our offshore and dra- offshore oil and gas drilling campaign materials, so it'd be a great place for the people Arctic, to go. The Arctic, the Gulf, Pacific, everything is there. Yep, everything's there. It's really focused on our campaign to pass local resolutions up and down the California coast in opposition to Trump's plan. Um, and so far, over 65 California communities have done that, and we're going to keep that rolling once the plan comes out as well. All right, Blake, thank you so much for being here. That brings us to the end of our Terra Verde program for today. Thanks to everyone who tuned in. A big thanks to our guests, Linda Kropp of the Environmental Defense Center and Blake Blake Kopshow of the Center for Biological Diversity. I want to thank them for joining us today on Terra Verde. I want to give a special thanks to Mike Cohn, the KPFA production and engineering crews. Without you, this unique KPFA program would not be possible. Remember, you can listen to the archives of this show on kpfa.org. Join us again for Terra Verde next week at 2 p.m. Dubbed the father of black history, Carter G. Woodson, the second black to garner a PhD from Harvard University, has been attributed with the origination of Negro History Week, initiated in 1926, corresponding with the birthdays of Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln. It was Woodson's belief that the teaching of black history was essential to ensure the physical and intellectual survival of people of African descent, stating, if a race has no history, it has no worthwhile tradition. It becomes a negligible factor in the thought of the world, and it stands in danger of being exterminated. In 1976, the expansion of Negro History Week to Black History Month was officially recognized by the U.S. government. 
This Black History Moment was brought to you by the Amandala Radio Collective of KPFA.